The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to another biology lesson. I'm your biology teacher for lower seat, Dama Charles Bobga. Before we go deeper into the lesson, we're going to flash back on our previous assignment. And that assignment was, should World Water Day be script support your answer? Remember that we talked a lot about World Water Day and awareness. So we're going to look at that, the plausible responses. So what are those things? In my own opinion, I don't know about you, in my own opinion, I think that they should not script the World Water Day. It should not be script. And what are the reasons? What are the important reasons? Many people and organizations lost focus and completely forget uh, uh, water. So this day carries, uh, comes with an awareness. So this day is the day to create awareness. So it should not be script. Number two is a day to examine whether this result, resource is well managed. People misuse water. People misuse water. Management must be sustainable. You can use it knowing that tomorrow you will use water. That's sustainability. You use it by putting strategies to conserve it. You use it sustainably by protecting the catchment, by not dumping waste into the water. So that's sustainable management. It's a day to visit the conservation strategies for this water. It's a day to uh, visit the conservation strategies. Let me tell you one of the things that, that uh, uh, causes this water shortage, deforestation. Forests are cut down. Forests are cut down, so it 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 um, it, 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 it hampers um, the the water cycle. Now we can also look at structure how we can recycle water. For example, the water that will flush the toilets can be recycled for drinking. I know in many countries this has been done. What do we do with all the water that comes uh, to us during the rainy season? It can be collected and conserved. I've read that in many journals and the countries. A country like Australia has a good sustainable water management uh, system. Countries like the Middle East, they lack water and they have used the salty water, desalinize it, and use it for extensive agriculture. That's what we call sustainable use of water. So, this World Water Day should not be script. I'm sure all of you are joining me, your teacher, to, to, to agree that this day should not be. The script. But today we're going to focus to deeper things about the properties of water. So our lesson plan, we're going to look at objectives, we're going to define and say what, what you need to know at the end of the lesson. We're going to build up on the previous information and pre information that you have already had. We're going to see how this water uh, as this lesson relates to our life uh, situation, we're going to bring in a lot of activities and exercises. And at the end, I'm going to give you an assignment. So this is very, very important. So uh, the objectives, you should be able to describe the properties of water. You should be able to relate these properties to the varied functions of water in nature. Body function of water. So what is the previous knowledge? What are you supposed to have known? Students have already studied about atoms and ions in chemistry and a lot about water up to now. 
So how they combine to form this water, the different states, we've already studied that. So if you miss those lessons, go back and study them. The lesson on atoms and ions. Now our real life situation, I keep saying that it is not possible that you separate the content that you're learning from your real life uh, situation. Can man do or live without water? Is there need for the World Water Day? It's still a very important uh, real, um, um, uh, real life situation. Now, we're going to cut an activity because water has physical properties and water has chemical properties. So the physical properties and the chemical properties, the attributes of this water. For example, water is tasteless. Water is tasteless. So the physical and the chemical properties of water. So they are very, very important. Now the task for this activity, we are going to relate these pictures to a physical property of water. For example, in the first picture, you have an insect that is moving on water surface. This insect is the water boatman. This insect is the water boatman. Now you have the other situation, a picture there, showing you an activity in water. Then you have um, that picture with a straw inside. With a straw inside. So we have to relate the properties of water to the activities that are there. Now look at it again. We have another picture of somebody swimming in water and then we'll have a kettle boiling and then we'll have um, uh, a straw uh, inside a color container. So these are all scenarios. I want to relate that scenario to a particular property of water. So what are the plausible responses, the answers to this question, when you relate the properties? For example, it's possible for the water boatman to be on the surface of water because of the water property called surface tension. So surface tension is that property that helps the insects. If you look at the legs, it's as if it's move, moving on dunlop. It's moving on a soft material, but because of the surface tension, we're going to come to that. If you look at the way uh, that picture is, it is exhibiting uh, the water property we call adhesion and cohesion. So that's a physical property of water. If you look at the third uh, photo, it is trying to, uh, it is giving you, uh, demonstrating the activity uh, of heat capacity. Remember that that water is being heated on a stove. Now look at, um, that is a mass of ice on water. So it's demonstrating the melting point. Remember that we are suffering a lot of problems with um, uh, 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 global warming now, where ice blocks are melting in the Arctic and Antarctic regions. So there's a melting point. When global temperatures become higher, it causes the ice to begin to melt. So that's the property of melting point we are demonstrating in that activity. Now look at the kettle on, on the stove. That property we're demonstrating there is known as the boiling point. So water has a boiling point. And now in the last picture, you see that when you took, take the thin straw, that's a thin straw, you put it inside a colored blue uh, uh, liquid container, water moves up the capillarity tube. That's a capillarity tube inside a beaker of colored water. So what property of water has been demonstrated there, capillarity, capillarity action. You're going to see that all these physical properties of water were mentioned. Physical properties of water we've mentioned uh, are related, uh, uh, help in the functioning of organisms. For example, capillary action will help you for water to move up the, 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 the xylem vessels to tall trees. Uh, the, the boiling point, water boils at 100, 100 degrees centigrade. So that gives an idea that 
water uh, can also uh, change state. Now, water can also change state from solid to liquid. So we're going to look at that in detail. Now, we are going to explain these physical properties. What, what brings about surface tension? Why would the water boatman place the, 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 the legs on water and it will not sink? I told you that that property is the surface tension. Now, remember that the legs of the water boatman can also be adapted to move on the surface of water. But it's a combination of the adapted legs and the surface tension properties. So what is surface tension? Surface tension is the elastic tendency of free surfaces. And this uh, lets insects and other organisms to be able to move on the surface of water. So water has surface tension. And so it is favored by other organisms to use as their habitat. That's why the water boatman uh, stays only in water. So surface tension is an important property of water and it has been exploited by insects and they move on water, they skate on water. Now we also saw that this surface tension, why is this surface tension? We also saw the force of cohesion because the cohesive forces between water molecules hold them together. There are also some other forces that hold the water molecules together called the Van der Waals forces. They also hold the water molecules together. That is why the insect can, can bounce on the surface of water. So along the surface of water, the particles are pulled towards the rest of the liquid. They are not separated, they are kept together. So they form a platform on which the insect can move. So the surface tension property is very important and it makes organisms uh, use water as their, as their habitat. Now, cohesion, adhesion. The water molecules are kept together by cohesion. If you put water inside a glass, there is a reaction, attraction between the water molecules and the walls of the glass. That attraction is adhesion. So a combination of cohesion, the water molecules together, and then adhesion, the water molecules and the glass repelling from each other, it keeps the water molecules together. This is what happens in the wall of the xylem. Why would you explain that water far in the soil will move to, uh, to, to the leaves of very tall trees because of the ability of water molecules to be together so the water column is unbroken, the water molecules are un unbroken, and the water goes up tall trees because the water does not go up, there will be no photosynthesis. So it goes to the leaves so that there is photosynthesis. So the force of cohesion and adhesion, they help to bring up water up tall trees. Now the adhesion makes sure that the, the, the walls of the xylem, though they are dead, should not break the water column, should not attract the water column. So there's a force of adhesion, repulsive force. So that is why water can move uh, through uh, thin xylem vessels to erect tall trees for photosynthesis. So cohesion, water molecules attracted together, adhesion, water molecules attracted to other substances. Uh, cohesion and adhesion of water uh, therefore makes it effective for the transpiration pool, for water to move up and, uh, and be used uh, by plants. So adhesion and cohesion are very important properties of water. So I've been already giving you examples of adhesion, cohesion. In the case of xylem, there is adhesion. Uh, of course, between water molecules and the walls of the xylem. And in the case of uh, xylem, cohesion occurs between water molecules. So cohesion, the water molecules are the same. So cohesive forces are favored by like molecules and adhesive forces are favored by uh, molecules that are not alike. So cohesion is necessary for the movement of water up tall trees. It is very important because we already saw hydrogen bonds and bond the world forces. They only act to these other forces of cohesion and adhesion, and the water column remains unbroken as it moves from the soil to the leaves of tall trees. To the leaves of tall trees. So it is uh, very, very important. Now, heat capacity is another very important. Um, function or property 
of water. The, the, the specific heat uh, capacity is defined as the amount of heat one gram of water must absorb or lose to change the temperature by one degree Celsius. So you remember that it is fishy stay in water because the specific heat capacity of water is high. It doesn't matter how much of sunlight reaches the water, the temperature of the water will not change to disfavor the aquatic organisms. So that property of having a high heat capacity helps the temperature not to rise and therefore makes the aquatic environment more favorable for aquatic life. If the temperatures were, were too hot, it's not possible for fishes to be there. So heat capacity is very important. Now we have um, also concerning heat capacity, uh, it is important to note that water's high heat capacity uh, has co uh, uh, heat capacity caused by hydrogen bonding uh, among the water molecules. So hydrogen bonding, bond, bond, hydrogen bonding is the cause, is what makes water to have a high heat capacity. So it needs a bit of higher temperature to be able to break the hydrogen bondings. So the amount uh, of, uh, of heat needed for this is um, uh, 4.184 joules of energy. So it's important that uh, we understand the biological significance of this heat capacity. It makes the aquatic environment comfortable. It makes the aquatic environment comfortable so that aquatic organisms, fish most especially, can live uh, freely. Now, what is the biological significance of the heat, heat capacity? The resistance to certain temperature changes makes water an excellent habitat. I've already mentioned that. So water is an excellent habitat. Water does not change, uh, tem uh, change uh, the water temperature does not change quickly. So it has, it is resistant to increase in temperature, allowing organisms to survive without experiencing a wide uh, fluctuation in the temperature changes in water. This property of heat capacity also allows uh, uh, regulation of internal body temperatures. Remember that Temperature is a factor of the internal environment, the blood and the tissue fluid, that must be kept constant. If temperature increases, it's a problem. If temperature goes too low, it's a problem. So, but the body has 90% water. So it doesn't matter how much of heat you, 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 you receive in your body, the temperature of the water that builds up your body cannot change significantly. So your body temperatures remain fairly constant at uh, 36 degrees centigrade and fluctuates very little. Remember that enzymes in your cells function within narrow temperature ranges. So enzymes will not therefore be denatured and so they'll be able uh, to, to, to function well in the biological cell system. So heat capacity is very important. Now let's look at melting points and, and boiling points. The melting point is usually defined as the point at which mater uh, materials change from one from solid to liquid. So when the ice, we saw a photo of the ice block melting, it means that it is changing from the solid ice to liquid. In your, in your home, when electricity goes off, the ice blocks in the fridge, that solid water, will begin to melt and change into liquid because of the temperature change. When temperature becomes hotter, it melts the ice, the ice block. So melting point is also very important. And water surely uh, has a, a higher melting point. That's why the world is so worried today because of the, the, the ice blocks in the Arctic and Antarctic that are beginning to melt because of global increase in world temperature, global warming. So it, become, it becomes a cause of concern for many countries. Now the boiling point, the boiling point of the liquid is the temperature at which um, water changes from liquid to vapor. So that's the boiling point. Remember that when you heat water and it's above 100 degrees centigrade, then water changes to vapor. When you freeze water, it's below zero degrees, it changes to solid. So temperature changes can cause the conversion of water 
in the different points. But boiling point specifically is when temperatures go higher than 100 and the water vaporizes. So it releases a latent heat of vaporization. Remember that latent heat of vaporization. Remember that it is of significance to the, to the life of the plant. Remember that evaporation from the leaf surface brings about cooling of the plant. So when there is heat of the sun and it hits the water molecules, it evaporates and carries along with it the latent heat of vaporization and that cools the plant. That's how the plant thermo regulates. But the mechanism in man, even when you sweat, the sweat carries heat out of your body, the latent heat of vaporization, and then after sweating, you experience a cooling of your body. So this is very important. So what is the biological significance of boiling point and melting point? So the melting point is so important as a physical property uh, of a compound because the melting point is used to identify, you can use it to identify a particular substance. So you can also use it to be able to determine the purities and the kind of purity. So substances have different melting points. For example, iron can be melted easily. Iron can be melted easily and, um, uh, than, uh, than wax. So they have different melting, melting points. So it is very important. Now, the other physical property which is, has a lot of significance in the life of the, the, the plant is capillarity action. Now, for, for this to function well, the tube in which the water moves, remember that we put a, a capillary tube inside colored water and the water moved by itself into the capillary tube. So in plants, the xylem vessels are thin, very thin. And this thinness of the vessel make them function like capillary tube. When water moves from the roots through the cortex and reaches the xylem, water has a tendency to move up the capillary tube aided by the forces of cohesion between the water molecules and the force of adhesion and even the surface tension of this water. So all these ones are very important to contribute to the overall transpiration pool or stream in the plants that causes water to move up uh, the xylem and the leaves of very tall plants. So capillary action is very, is very, very important. Now, capillary action um, is important for the ascent of sap. Remember that sometimes we talk about translocation is the ascent and the descent of material in the plant. Water ascends, food material descends. And um, it is all with the help of capillarity action. There are many other forces that will support this capillarity, but capillarity action and transpiration pool are the main forces that will cause water to move up the leaves of tall plants. Now, we'll look at some biological functions of water, uh, functions of water in living organism. Water performs a variety of functions. We're going to say water is a universal solvent. All the salt in our body, all the sugar, we saw it already, all the nutrients that are dissolved in water. So it's a universal solvent. It means they can dissolve many substances more substances than any other liquid. Water can dissolve many other substances uh, more than any other liquid. Why? We have seen the properties of water. That water, because of its polarity, can attract the negative and the positive um, substances or ions and then disintegrate them and so dissolving them. So water is a universal, universal solvent. Also, you can see from the diagram, how water dissolves uh, the salt. Uh, that is the organic, the, 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 that is uh, oxygen. You see oxygen, uh, the, the water polarized, oxygen, hydrogen in red. So you see that this is now a solution of sodium chloride, for example. And this sodium chloride, uh, the chloride is attracted to the hydrogen and the, the sodium is attracted uh, uh, to the negative ion. So water attracts and dissolves them. So water is a universal, a universal solvent. So uh, water dissolves salts. We have seen that in the last lesson. So 
we are not going to spend a lot of time. So salt dissolves in water. So it's a special mechanism. Uh, of all the barrier substances, not every substance dissolves uh, uh, in water. For example, there are some substances that form the category of fats and oils, and large polymers, uh, like polysaccharides, sometimes start, they don't dissolve easily in water. So if it's a universal solvent, it means it dissolves more than 90% of most of the substances in which it will be uh, dissolved. So that is very important. Now, because of the solubility of water and the amount of uh, 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 ions and substance molecules that can be in water, water can at a particular time contain different uh, types of solution. And we're going to see that. But when the solvent and the solid mix, it forms a solution. It's no more water, it's no more the solid, but it is a solution. So the solvent and the solute, they form part of the solution. But we have different categories of solution. We have seen that in, I mean, you have seen that in your chemistry lesson, but we are not seeing now how it applies uh, to biology. A solution can be saturated. Sometimes at the GC practicals, they want you to prepare a solution of saturated, a saturated salt solution. So what will you do? Is that solution that contains the maximum amount of solute that is capable of being dissolved. So it's just saturated. So you, you put uh, a, um, the amount of salt or the amount of sugar that will not bring about excess of the salt. But the water molecule was just enough to, to pick out the, 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 the charged particles of uh, the salt or the dissolved material. That is a saturated solution. Solution that contains maximum amount of salt that is capable of being dissolved. Now another category is the unsaturated solution. A solution that contains less than the less amount, less than the maximum amount of solid that is capable of being dissolved by the solvent. So that is uh, unsaturated. We also have a supersaturated solution, a solution that contains more than the maximum amount of solute that can be capable of being dissolved at a particular temperature. So in nature, we have different varieties of proportions of solvent and solutes. So we we'll meet those circumstances. But in the practical, in the biology particles, you may be asked to prepare uh, these particular solutions and then study how uh, various uh, things will behave, uh, how will behave, cells will behave in these kinds of solutions. But also, there's the concept of hypertonic solution, a solution that contains more dissolved particles, such as salt and other electrolytes than found in normal uh, cells. Now, let me simplify that hypertonic solution. A hypertonic solution will have more salt and less water. If you take a cup of salt and you add you get a cup of water and you add too much salt, that solution becomes more salty, or we can say it is hypertonic. So hypertonic solutions are not good in the system. When plants or organisms are found in hypertonic solutions, it becomes a problem. It becomes a hemostatic problem. So cells are trying as much as possible to regulate the amount of salt so that at any given moment, they are not uh, found, uh, it, the environment is not dangerous to them. So hypertonic solution is a solution we are going to meet. So we have cells can be placed in hypertonic solution. For example, um, for example, during the exam, they can give you particular cells and ask you to put them in different solutions. And then you see how they'll behave. And you now will appreciate the danger of, uh, uh, of uh, that type of hypertonic solution appearing. Remember that in the farmlands, in our farms, when there is application of fertilizer, the fertilizers have a lot of salts. So they'll make the soil becomes a hypertonic medium and it's not very favorable for the, the plants. And when there is a hypertonic solution surrounding a cell or an organism, water tends to move out. That's what we call ex osmosis. So water moves out of uh, the cell. So we have also a hypotonic solution, a solution that has a low amount of solute compared to the solute concentration. But hypotonic solution, in the simplest sense, can be a solution that has less salt and much water. Less salt and much water. 
So organisms, if, uh, in some conditions, in some situations, found themselves in hypotonic solution. And when that happens, and this, the compartments are separated by a semi-permeable membrane, for example, the cell of the body and cells of plant act as osmometers. And so there will be osmosis that takes place. So a hypotonic solution, uh, an organism placed in a hypotonic solution has the danger of, of influx of water. So we're going to see problems that fish feel, uh, face in fresh water. The amoeba in fresh water therefore develops a strategy to remove the water. That's why you have the contractile vacuums in them. So hypotonic solutions are not good. They will have isotonic solutions. Some organisms have strategized to keep the internal environment the same salt concentration as the medium in which they are found. So when the concentration of salts in both compartments separated by a, 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 a semiple membrane are the same, then we describe them as isotonic environments or isotonic solution. Remember that sometimes uh, in hospitals we receive infusion, we receive fruits, saline, we receive uh, 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 infusion from the hospital. They cannot give you an infusion that will, will, um, ch uh, will change your os osmotic uh, situation in the body. So that is very important. So general water supports a large structure. But in plants, the water will come in by osmosis, but because the plant cells are resistant, so they will create a wall pressure and they will not break. But in the case of animals, water will support the cellular structure to a certain degree. Because if an amoeba cells keep taking water, it will explode. That's why it has to remove the water as fast as the water enters. So it is very, very important. So water is a medium for all chemical reactions in the cell. So for photosynthesis, we see water. For polymerization of biomolecules, we see water. For breakdown of large molecules, we see water. So water is very important. Water also acts as a buffer. A buffer means that when heat is, is high, it, it cushions the extra heat. Uh, it cushions the extra heat. So water acts as a temperature buffer because of its high heat capacity. We have already seen that. So water acts as a metabolite. Water is a metabolite in the process of like respiration, in the process that, that will split ATP into its constituent ADP and inorganic phosphorus. Before we end this lesson, I'll keep you with an assignment. I want you to be able to identify and name the foodstuff that you see in the pictures. There is A, B, C uh, foodstuff. And then remember that after the lesson, you go home, you study textbooks and see to add to your knowledge. So we have come to the end of our lesson. And our next lesson will be on biochemistry of carbohydrates. One. Una tege si, ma tege yop, una tege minga, ma tege nyum, una tege majang, ma tege ndom, ma ne tambia niña ne injubia yen, ngani bana, ma tege mot, ngani la kiri wa tege ndom, esa kina bia dinkido, ma ne tambia niña ne injubia yen, tam tama mote tam zabike. Tam tam a tonge tam zabike tam 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 a mote tam zabike mane tam bia niña ne injo bia yen 